Hi, folks. This is Ann Reynolds. I'm going to be moderating this session. Sorry for those of you that are tired of hearing me talk. <laughs> I feel like I've been doing a lot of talking during the conference today. Um, but we're going to wait just a minute to let I can see folks are still joining. Um, and I'm going to check in to make sure that I have all the panelists here. Um, And it looks like I do. All right, great. Okay, so thank you all for joining this breakout session. Um, and I will, will say, just in case it's not too confusing, in the chat, there's a link to join the other breakout session. And that's in case you ended up in the wrong one. We're like the teachers that say, if you're not supposed to be in social studies, <laughs> you're in the wrong room. So if you do actually wanna be in the building electrification one, you can jump over there. But we're going to talk about zone J and it's been um, common knowledge and a continuing challenge that while the grid upstate is relatively low carbon, especially when compared to the average for the United States, we're well above average in being low carbon up in upstate New York. That's because we have um, extensive hydroelectric resources. We have nuclear power upstate and increasingly we have wind and solar resources. In Zone J, which is the name for the ISO zone that includes New York City, the story is a bit different because there's been a transmission congestion from upstate to downstate um, and because there's not hydro, nuclear, wind and solar uh, in New York City to the same level that there is upstate. So what are the solutions to greening the grid of New York City? That's what we're going to explore today. Uh, we have a great group of people to do that. Suzanne Derochas, Deputy Director for Energy and Infrastructure at the New York City Mayor's Office of Sustainability and Office of Climate Resilience. Hi, Suzanne, is with us. Uh, Noah Ginsberg is the Director of Here Comes Solar at Solar One, an organization that is uh, working on solar installation specifically in New York City metropolitan area. We have Nathaniel Green, senior renewable energy advocate and old friend at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Not that you're old, Nathaniel, but we, <laughs> we've been uh, working in renewable energy for a long time. We have Luke Falk, who's the vice president of Energy Re, um, as well as Shashank Sani, who's executive vice president for transmission at Invenergy. And uh, both Luke and Shashank are working really hard right now in a focused way on a new project uh, to uh, build some new transmission for renewable energy to come into New York City. So it's absolutely central to the topic of today's panel. So I'm gonna start with Suzanne and ask you uh, to say a little bit about uh, New York City's view on the issue of greening the grid uh, of New York City and what you think are the goals for New York City's grid and, and given your um, extensive experience in the city on these questions, what are the challenges to greening New York City's grid? Thanks, Anne, and, and thanks for the invitation today. This has been a, a great day so far and I hope um, and think we're gonna learn a lot from all these different panelists today. So I'm gonna kind of set a broad context first um, in terms of what New York City's clean energy goals are. So, you know, we're, we're in a great and pivotal moment, certainly with the commitments that the city has made towards 100% clean electricity by 2040, uh, the passing of CLCBA, which, you know, we are talking a lot about, which uh, the same goals uh, exist there. Um, but specifically, and you touched a little bit uh, on, a little bit on this um, in your opening remarks, you know, we have a unique situation in New York City. Not only are we constrained by existing transmission, but we also have a very old and polluting fleet um, that essentially we're required to have by um, 
or liability rules. So in terms of where that leads our goals, we both want to ensure that the clean energy transition is reliable and resilient, right? So how do we take those old power plants offline while bringing in new renewable resources and maintaining not just a reliable grid, but actually a more resilient grid. Um, you know, we're expecting to see days over 90 degrees triple in New York City. Um, we've had some historic rainfall events just in the last few months, tragically killing uh, 13 New York City residents. So, you know, we're seeing the climate around us change. We have to pivot very quickly into um, new and clean resources and make sure we're making those resources resilient uh, to what's what's coming. And then lastly, I'll say that, you know, we're very, very concerned about affordability um, as we make this transition. So, you know, we've done some work here on energy cost burden. The state sets the target at 6% um, of a person's, um, you know, uh, a person's salary can be spent on on energy costs. Uh, we see about 1.5 million New York City residents that are above that target. Um, often these are low income New Yorkers, um, and this is really uh, an issue that you know the, the city has raised many times. Um, we were successful in petitioning uh, a new way to calculate low income uh, benefits through through the PSC. So we look forward to continuing that work, in particular as we look at how the CLC. BA requires benefits going to EJ communities, of which New York City ha has a lot of EJ communities. Um, just to, to touch on a couple of other things, you know, density certainly is an issue for us. Um, you know, we're the size, we're the population of Massachusetts and one thirty-fifth the size. Like that little statistic, we have a t you know lots of people in a tiny space. So yeah, looking forward to hearing Noah talk a little bit more about um, how we're approaching solar. And really, our strategy is twofold. One, how do we increase dramatically? Uh, distributed energy resources within the city boundaries. And then, as we're going to hear more about in this panel, how do we bring resources in from elsewhere through new transmission? Um, the city's made a lot of progress. Uh, there's a lot more to do. We have about 285 megawatts of solar now. Um, you know, that number we, we hope to get to be about 1,000 by uh, 2030. And really, we need this for a number of reasons, not just to um, increase penetration of renewables, but we really need it to decrease the demand on the grid um, during peak events. Um, we're going to electrify our building stock, which means over the course of time, we'll become a, a dual peaking system. So we'll be peaking in the winter and the summer. And so we need to use all of these different strategies in order to maintain that reliable grid and, and reduce the amount of energy that our building stock uses. Um, which leads me to storage. So uh, we also have a target for storage, 500 megawatts by 2025, very ambitious. Um, and we know that the city needs to move quicker to get these projects through our own permitting process. We've made a lot of progress there. Um, we've been working with FDNY and Department of Buildings to make sure those processes are clear to the, developer, to the developers that want to bring storage into New York City. We've changed our zoning rules recently. Uh, the fire code is under review and um, being revised to provide a pathway for indoor storage, which is a which is a great achievement. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, to those rules moving through their regulatory process. And then there's some bulk uh, bulk storage. Uh, solicitations that Con Edison has been doing, a 100 megawatt project in Astoria that was announced, as well as um, 200 megawatts of procurement, hopefully, um, in, in the coming months. So, you know, we're, we're really excited about the opportunity to get DERs in the city. We think it's equally important to what we're going to hear more about, which is bringing more transmission in, right? So we know we need transmission. We've been beating that drum for at least a decade. Uh, the tale of two grids, I'm sure, is something that everybody is very familiar with. We're 
super excited about uh, the governor's recent announcement uh, of the two different transmission lines that, that were chosen through the tier four procurement. Um, and, you know, importantly, we really need that power to be co considered, and sorry for the wonkiness, but I think most folks know what I'm talking about. We need it to be capacity um, because, you know, with our 80% roughly, depending on the year, 80% re capacity requirement, you know, we're, we're holding on to this old uh, dirty fleet and we need to make sure that these new resources come in on day one as capacity resources in order to be able to start to transition away from that from that polluting fleet. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. That was kind of a, our, all of our broad goals um, and some of our targets and progress we've made to date, Anne. Thanks so much for that. You covered a lot of territory. Um, that capacity thing, you know, years back, we used to call it the in-city generation rule. Is that still what it's called? <laughs> so, yes, it's called a lot of different things, but yes, in-city capacity generation is fine. So thank you for that. Um, sure. from, from your perspective, I can tell that you, you think about all the different moving parts, right, to how That's to right. be in New York City's grid. Um, we are going to turn to Noah now, who, as far as I understand it, mostly thinks about solar in the city. And I think uh, Noah also has a couple of slides to show. That's right, Noah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, th thanks, Anne. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, and I'll keep uh, my slides brief uh, just to introduce uh, Solar One and the work that we're doing um, to advance rooftop solar in New York City. Um, I'm seeing uh, a notepad right now. Um, not the presentation, but um, I'll, I'll dive right in. Um, so Solar One's an environmental nonprofit in New York City. We've been around for about 20 years. Uh, we have three citywide programs. We do workforce training uh, with workforce agencies all over the city, um, working with unemployed New Yorkers to improve their skills and help them get jobs in clean energy, energy efficiency, and building operations and maintenance. We do environmental education in the public schools. And then um, we have a solar technical assistance program, which is uh, the program that um, that I run for Solar One. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, this is our team um, doing the solar technical assistance, really kind of the heart of the work um, is, is the folks. Um, we have uh, three major focus areas. Um, we, as a nonprofit, we specifically focus on segments of the market that are underserved, or where we think there's a need for nonprofit intervention. The majority of our work is getting solar onto multifamily affordable housing in New York City. Uh, but we also have a community solar program uh, to expand access to solar for low-income renters. And we have a solar with battery backup program, a resilient solar program um, that's working with the governor's office to deploy solar and battery backup in uh, community facilities and areas that were hit by Superstorm Sandy. Um, next slide. This is our technical assistance model. This is what we do with uh, individual buildings um, and community groups that participate in our program. Keep rolling. I want to blast through these quickly because I have a few comments about policy. This is are some of our partners. We work with nonprofits and housing groups and city agencies. Um, to date, we've developed about 24 megawatts of solar, um, primarily rooftop solar, primarily on affordable housing and low-income communities, a lot of it in partnership with environmental justice groups and community organizations. Um, so um, it's, it, it's, it's not nothing, uh, but we also recognize that there's a need for um, for all of the above, right? We're, we're, we're focused on rooftop solar in the city. Um, we think that that's gonna create a huge amount of value, uh, workforce benefits, um, jobs in New York City that can't be outsourced um, and, and all of that, but obviously very supportive of bringing in uh, renewables from upstate and offshore too. Um, the, the next slide um, has just, uh, you know, a couple of the, the major points, um, sort of the case for rooftop solar in zone J. Um, so creating jobs, um, we tie our solar technical assistance program to our workforce program whenever possible, um, get uh, our job trainees, the majority of whom are unemployed, um, good jobs in the solar industry. These are good, um, good entry level jobs with opportunities for career advancement. Um, you know, the local economic development benefits of having a robust local market, then obviously all the environmental health and environmental justice benefits and the grid benefits that Suzanne spoke about. Um, and, you know, we, I think that this is really kind of part of um, just part of an ecosystem. We need uh, large scale renewables. We need rooftop renewables. Um, I'd say the big thing that rooftop in city renewables can provide that the upstate renewables can't provide 
is jobs for unemployed New Yorkers and mm -hmm. those local economic uh, development benefits. Um, there are a lot of headwinds facing the industry right now. Um, the community solar program in Con Edison territory just lapsed uh, earlier this month. Um, that's despite a lot of advocacy from the city, um, Solar One, a lot of other groups um, to try to get the state to extend that program. Actually, half of that program was taken up by natural gas systems that uh, essentially exploited a loophole in the program um, with some uh, financing from the New York Green Bank, uh, I'll add, um, to, to get those projects built instead of uh, zero emissions uh, solar. Um, so we're hopeful that that'll get extended. Um, the Public Service Commission's also directed uh, utility statewide to uh, impose a new fee on net metered solar customers starting in January. Um, and the combination of those two things are uh, really gonna impede growth in the solar industry. Um, you know, and, and, and the, the analogy that, that, that I've been, been toying with over here for how to describe it is like, you know, New York is doing the right things, but it um, doesn't necessarily have its eye on the ball for what the market needs right now. And the stop and start is really bad for industry. It's really bad for our job creation goals, our equity goals, all of that. Um, and the, the analogy that I'll, that, I'll, that I'll leave with is I think that um, New York has decided it's buying a Tesla, so it stopped changing the oil on its Honda Civic. And, uh, you know, we need to, we need to keep, keep things rolling. Um, and, uh, and then hopefully the industry will be in a better position to scale up to meet the big challenge in front of us. Thanks so much, Noah. Hey, uh, Nathaniel's up next, but I do have a question. Um, with your technical assistance model, do, do folks come to you like building owners or solar companies or do you go find them and ask them to participate? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so we do a lot of work um, in partnership with other organizations. So um, we're, uh, for example, we are New York City's Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Um, we're their consultant and we support all of the affordable housing that comes to the city. Um, so there's kind of like a built-in pipeline of folks that will come to us through that. Um, we're also a partner on the New York City Accelerator Program. Um, and then we do work in partnership with other community-based organizations that are doing campaigns at the neighborhood level. Um, so a lot of the outreach um, is done kind of through partners, um, but absolutely, if there's a, a, a building owner that's interested in solar, um, they could reach out to us and uh, we would be happy to help. And in some cases, that means rooting them through um, one of these great city programs, uh, or it means uh, helping them out through kind of another program. Got it. Thank you. Okay, let's switch from one solution to greening the grid, which is solar and city, to another, which is offshore wind. And so we're going to ask Nathaniel um, if he could describe the current status of offshore wind uh, development in New York City and its role in greening the grid. Hi, Nathaniel. Hi, Anne, uh, and thanks for having me. And thanks for not calling me old. Um, and uh, it's great to see everybody here today. It's a really exciting um, uh, conference. Um, I have some slides, uh, but just really short ones to sort of orient us a little bit uh, with offshore wind. Um, and just to start, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, the Natural Resource Defense Council, we're a, a, a big environmental nonprofit. We work across the country, a little bit around the world. Uh, we have about 3 million members and activists, uh, seven, 800 uh, scientists and staff uh, working to um, try to protect all aspects of our environment. Um, and I work specifically on renewable energy, trying to coordinate all of our uh, renewable energy advocacy across the country. Um, and a big part of my job is working, trying to make sure we build out uh, our offshore wind energy potential uh, here in the United States in a responsible way, because we, uh, we desperately need this new technology. Um, and we also need to make sure we do it right from the beginning. Um, and the beginning is really where we are. Uh, um, uh, people may have heard of the Block Island offshore wind project. Uh, that's um, five turbines, and then there's uh, two down in uh, Virginia, off the coast of Virginia, um, and that's what we have in the water here. But the tech, the whole industry has been around, as, as uh, folks may know, uh, and been going gangbusters in Europe for um, almost two decades now. Uh, and um, New York has been a real leader in, in uh, 
in seeing the potential and really trying to um, figure out how to make it happen. Um, uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, uh, it's a little small, uh, I'm sorry for that, but this is a, a, a bone slide, so um, it's easily to easy, pretty easy to find on the internet. Um, these are the uh, lease areas that uh, we have um, here in the United States to date. Uh, um, and it starts here on the left-hand side, at least my left-hand side uh, in the Northeast. Um, and that uh, um, doesn't show the Block Island project, I don't think, um, but it does show the, the one that's expected to come next, the Vineyard Wind Project. Um, uh, which is just south of Martha's Vineyard. Um, uh, the first project that's probably going to connect into New York is also showed in this box, and it's called the Sunrise or the South Fork project. Sorry, um, it's uh, a little yellow blob um, in that mix, and it's going to connect to um, the south end of Long Island, um, the, the eastern end of Long Island, um, on the south side of the eastern end of Long Island. Um, and uh, then if you look in the next, uh, the middle panel here, um, you can see a bunch of the areas that are closer to New York City. Um, and in fact, if we go to the next slide, um, and then I'll be done with the slides. These are the areas that BOEM is on the verge of, uh, of leasing. Um, this is what's known as the New York Bite. And you can see Long Island there at the, the top of the map. Um, and these green areas are um, leases that BOEM has proposed uh, to auction. Um, and the expectation is that they'll probably um, approve those for auction uh, in the end of this year, beginning of next year. Um, and uh, there's, uh, so there you can see there's a lot of, um, a lot of areas that are pretty close to the city. Um, and in fact, uh, if we went back to the other side, which we shouldn't, but uh, there's, um, uh, there is one, a lease area um, that uh, was won by Equinor. Um, uh, it has, they've broken into two parts. So there's two projects, Empire One and Two, that are um, uh, just south of Long Island. Um, those are likely to connect into the city. Um, and all of these sort of fit uh, neatly are starting to sort of fill the, the vision that New York has set out to, uh, to connect nine gigawatts of offshore wind into New York uh, by 2035. Um, and a lot of that will connect uh, onto Long Island, um, but a lot of it will connect into Zone J. Um, uh, so just to give folks a little bit of context, uh, summer peak load in zone J uh, is about 11 and a half gigawatts. Um, uh, so if we connected, let's say about six gigawatts of offshore wind in, um, uh, you can see that would make a, a real big contribution. And the, the transmission lines that the governor uh, mentioned um, are about three gigawatts. Uh, there's the solar goal, um, the storage goal. So you see, we can we can see a pathway uh, ahead of us where we start uh, making a, a real big contribution to the city's um, uh, even the city's peak energy demand um, through these resources. Uh, but we're not getting all the way there. Certainly by 2035, but we're on the right path. Um, uh, I think to stay on that path and to make sure offshore wind really uh, meets its uh, you know makes the contribution that we want from it. There are a few things we need to uh, make sure that we do as we develop these first projects. Um, uh, from my perspective, one of the biggest ones is make sure that we're developing the projects in a way that's protective of the marine environment in which they'll be built. Um, and building them is sort of the, is one of the biggest uh, moments because there's a lot of ships out there. There's a lot of construction noise and the potential to uh, you know, impact the marine environment and particularly some of the, um, the most sensitive species like the North Atlantic right whale, which is a critically endangered species is sort of most acute during that construction phase. So we've been really working with the industry and with the, uh, the agencies that uh, do the permitting, try to make sure we build out um, these first projects uh, um, in the most protective way 
for those, uh, particularly for those particularly endangered species. Um, there's also what happens onshore uh, and who, uh, you know, where we get the, the, the workers that are going to build these projects, maintain the projects, um, and maintain the, uh, uh, the ports where we uh, put all the equipment uh, um, and, and components that we need onto boats and take them out. Um, and so there's been a lot of effort to really make sure that some of that, uh, um, the, the industry that builds up to build these, uh, these offshore wind farms and maintain them happens here in New York and particularly happens here in New York City. Um, uh, South Brooklyn uh, port looks to be um, poised to become a, a hub of a lot of that activity. And uh, we wanna have job training here in New York. So um, I think if we, you can see, uh, uh, it's, it, it, and one of the really exciting things about offshore wind is this, this path forward, um, not just to large numbers of gigawatts coming into the city where we need it to the most acutely from air quality perspective, reliability perspective, all the, um, points we started to talk about, but also that we do it in a way that um, puts people to work and does it in a way that's really protective of the marine environment. Um, so with that, I think I'll, uh, I'll stop and have to take questions now and later. Thanks, Nathaniel. We're going to go to Luke for a moment, though, before we come back with questions. Uh, Luke Falk uh, from Energy Re, who also has slides. and. Um, Hi, Luke. Hey, how are you, Anne? I'm good. So uh, we're happy to have you here to describe the Clean Path project to us, its current status, and why it is relevant to the topic of greening the grid of New York City. So I'll turn it over to you. I appreciate it. Maybe we could also include Shashank, uh, and we'll just do it together. That sounds good to me. We can yeah. have Shashank on screen, too. There he awesome. is. So Thank you so much for having us today. We're such huge fans of Ace New York and you personally, Anne, and, and everything you do for the industry. So I uh, appreciate you giving us an opportunity to talk to the community about our project, about which we are also super enthusiastic, um, having recently been designated by NYSERDA for a Tier 4 award. Um, the project is called Clean Path New York. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Um, the partners behind the project. It's a public-private partnership being advanced by um, the New York Power Authority, um, which is the largest state-owned uh, uh, utility in the country. Um, energy Re, which is a clean energy development firm um, located here in New York City, started by the principals of the related companies, which is a real estate firm also located in New York and elsewhere. Um, and Invenergy, with whom Shashank is associated, and I'll let him introduce himself and Invenergy. Great. Thanks, Luke, and thanks to Ace New York for this uh, event today. Uh, Invenergy is the largest privately held developer of clean energy resources in the country. Uh, we've got a 20-year track record of developing wind, solar, battery storage, transmission, and other clean energy technologies across the country and really the globe. Uh, we've developed over 27,000 megawatts of clean energy projects uh, since our inception. Uh, and most importantly, um, a large portion of that is in the state of New York. We've had a long history in New York State, um, really dating back to the mid 2000s with our first project entering operation in 2008 and uh, continued um, you know, track record of success since that time with a number of other projects getting developed and constructed. Great. So maybe we can go to the next slide. So, uh, yeah. So, Shashank, you want to explain what we're trying to do here? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as Luke mentioned, we were very excited and honored to receive a Tier 4 award for Clean Path New York. Uh, Clean Path is really one of the uh, most significant from a, a scale and, and, uh, and scope perspective in the renewable space in really the history of the country. And most importantly, it is all within New York State. The project was selected as part of the Tier 4 program to deliver renewable energy into New York City. Uh, and while that may you know, sound easy on, on the surface, uh, in order to actually accomplish that, it requires a pretty broad 
set of, of infrastructure assets to deliver on that. So the pieces of Clean Path New York are um, 3,800 megawatts of new renewable energy uh, developed and constructed in upstate New York, comprised of roughly half and half wind and solar, um, a new 175 mile uh, high voltage direct current transmission line, and, and uh, finally a 1,160 megawatt pump storage facility, which actually already exists and is owned by the New York Power Authority. So, you know, each component of that um, mix has its own unique uh, reason to be, be a part of this. You know, the renewable energy is required to deliver, to generate those uh, zero carbon electrons. But really the, the heart of the project is the new transmission line. The transmission line is being uh, developed entirely underground and using as many existing rights of way and, uh, and corridors as possible. So for roughly 100 of the 175 miles, we'll be within an existing uh, New York Power Authority transmission corridor. And for the remainder of it, we'll be in, the, in public roads and the, the river to ultimately end up in, in Queens. And the transmission line, while at its core, is serving the need of bringing renewable energy into, the, into New York City, it has a lot of additional benefits for, uh, for the grid in New York State. Uh, I think we've talked earlier in the discussion about the tale of two grids and, and the separation between upstate and downstate. And this line really addresses a lot of that congestion. It, it crosses the key inner or the key congestion point in the market and will re really allow a greater flow of energy between upstate and downstate, primarily to serve, you know, delivering that clean path energy into New York City, but also for general reliability purposes to ensure a strong, robust grid in New York State and also really to serve as a complement for all that offshore wind that was just discussed to be, to be built. So really from an energy perspective, it is a key asset of the state and will be an asset for long after the 25 year contract uh, of Clean Path. The final piece that I'll, I'll note is the pump storage facility that is currently owned by NIPA. This will be a key asset in ensuring that we're able to utilize the transmission line to its maximum ability. Wind and solar obviously have some variation in their output and what the pump storage facility will do will allow us to store that energy during times when the renewables are producing more than the transmission line can, uh, can convey and then discharge that during periods of low production. So it really allows the maximum utilization of the transmission line. And again, going back to the, the stability and the resilience of the grid. So we're very excited about the, the project and, and all the components that lead into it. And uh, you know, Luke can discuss more about what that means for the state. Yeah, so if we go to the next slide, um, you know, I mean, it just can't be overstated how um, hugely impactful the project will be on several different levels. Um, you know, the scale of the project is, um, as Shashong said, historic and, and somewhat unparalleled. Uh, we're talking about an $11 billion overall initiative between the generation and the transmission assets, um, all of which is inside of New York State. So um, in terms of constructing and operating all of those assets, um, we create 8,300 jobs, which are all located here in New York. Um, Shashong talked earlier about the longevity of transmission assets um, and the contract with NYSERDA to enable the project is a 25 year term. Because of our partnership with NIPA um, and the true nature of the public private partnership that's being brought to bear here, at the end of NYSERDA's 25 year contract term, NIPA will assume ownership of the transmission line so that it can be used as an asset of the state um, for the people of the state. Um, in terms of jobs, uh, everything directly enabled by the project will be um, covered under a PLA uh, that we're going to advance with our, our friends in the union world. Uh, we think it's important to include unions in what we're trying to do to ensure that the jobs we, we create in this project are good ones um, with uh, good wages and benefits. Uh, in terms of um, the CLCPA and its ambition to drive 40% of the benefit of spend on clean energy programs into frontline communities across the state. Um, we looked at this a couple of different ways. 
Um, we're really excited about how our project is positioned to deliver on that ambition. Uh, so if you look at benefits in two ways, direct investments um, that are made uh, for the construction and operation of both transmission and generation, um, and you couple that with the directly induced supply chain effects of providing goods and services to that activity, um, as well as a community investment fund that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and you look at where all of that activity happens geographically in reference to um, what will be established as the sort of EJ areas across the state, um, we see a huge amount of our project uh, occurring within those boundaries. Um, additionally, we're going to um, prioritize reaching out to um, MWBE and, and other um, designated entities to ensure that uh, we include um, all aspects of the community in, in, in delivering our project for the state. Um, if you look at the other side of benefits, we think about just intrinsic natural benefits that accrue because of uh, the delivery of clean energy into, into New York City. So our project will reduce carbon emissions by 39 million tons over the 25 year term. Uh, it'll reduce fossil fuel fire generation by 22% per year across the state, uh, because even though the energy goes into zone J, it has ramifications for the electric system broadly across the state. Um, it reduces criteria air pollutants like NOx, SOx, and PM 2.5 by between 20 and 22% per year on average. Um, and when you take all of those emissions reductions and you couple them with um, climate change hardening and mitigation uh, impacts that will bring to bear, um, you see billions of dollars of uh, social and public health benefits that accrue to frontline communities and, and all communities broadly uh, by virtue of our effort. Uh, and so when you take all of that together, uh, you know, we are very well positioned to make good on, on what the CLCPA wants to accomplish. Um, now, I'll just take a moment to talk specifically about a $270 million community investment fund that we're going to establish as part of the effort um, with a focus on um, frontline communities and, and remediating some of the longstanding um, imbalances and equity uh, pursuant to environmental justice issues. So this fund is going to be targeted toward four broad pillars of engagement one around workforce development and enabling the just transition um, in a way that creates pathways and linkages to frontline communities to uh, get them to participate um, in our project and projects like our project. Um, then there's uh, an initiative around education broadly, all things climate justice and clean energy uh, with a focus on working in frontline communities, um, expanding health, uh, access to healthcare, uh, I think is very important for us and for everybody, especially with a focus um, on the communities that have borne this disproportionate burden of the fossil fuel economy for so long. Uh, and then finally, we're going to have a focus on environmental stewardship and conservation, which may mean, you know, traditional land conservation, given the geographic footprint of our project, um, upstate, uh, this might be expanding recreation opportunities, conserving land. Um, downstate, it may look like, um, you know, investments in parks, um, as well as, um, to Suzanne's point earlier around the need for electrification, funding electrification retrofits and affordable housing, um, you know, so that in its own right begets a virtuous cycle of reinvestment in communities and workforce development uh, activity. So I know we just said a lot. Um, but it's a big project, uh, and uh, we are just so thrilled to be able to uh, to answer any questions about anything that uh, we're undertaking. So thank you for having us. Thank you, Luke and Shashank, for describing the project to us. And we're going to take some questions now from the audience or me, interspersed there. So if I could have all of the panelists on screen, that would be helpful. What we essentially um, have here 
is a technical economic safety and reliability challenge, but you know, we just saw three three of the solutions, right? Um, solar in, in city, offshore, off the coast, feeding into the city and new transmission lines feeding into the city and del delivering renewable power from upstate. Um, I do have one uh, question here from Anonymous, <laughs> uh, but that is, could you talk about the timing of the Clean Path Project? What's the target date for completion? Yeah, um, so there, there's obviously a number of components uh, that comprise Clean Path uh, with all the generation projects uh, and the transmission line. On the, the wind and solar uh, projects, they are in various stages of advancement. Uh, a number of them are actually ready to be built. And so we'll be moving forward with construction uh, in the next several months. Uh, others uh, continue to need more development work and, and permitting. So those will be going through their process and reaching construction over the next several years. On the transmission line, uh, you know, the key upcoming activity is the Article 7 approval, um, which is, you know, required by, by the state. So we'll be uh, engaging with stakeholders over the next several months with the goal of submitting our Article 7 application uh, later next year. Altogether, that means that our target date for uh, the entirety of the project being operational is mid-2027. Got it. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask Suzanne a question. So, you know, uh, I'm tempted to ask the question, can we do it? <laughs> can we can we green, green the grid of New York City? But maybe a, a, a different way to ask that, too, is we, we've heard about solar, offshore wind, new transmission. Uh, you mentioned storage, too. Um, what's missing or looking at what's happening now in the uh, energy arena? Does it seem like it's going to be possible to to completely green the grid by 2035 or 2040? So um, I'm a very optimistic person. I don't think that you can work in this space without being an optimistic person. But I will say that, you know, when I when I started being the director of regulatory for New York City five years ago, a lot of this was not on the table. And I think that we've just seen this incredible commitment um, both from, you know, the, the transformation of the offshore wind industry to, you know, the new tier four, um, plus all of the work that's been done to facilitate solar. Um, you know, it's, it's astonishing. Um, I think it is possible. Uh, I think, you know, we've got some really good winds at our back. Um, you look at polling, uh, folks are really starting to be very concerned about what they're seeing happen in the in the climate. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, fingers crossed that um, the, the infrastructure bill gets through the at the federal level. But I, I think you're going to start to see more support for these types of changes, especially, um, you know, as when you look at what's happening in the youth climate movement and there's, you know, there are a lot of demands on, on this transition happening and happening quickly. So I have a lot of optimism. The one thing that I would say that I think we need to continue to push hard is um, where, how do we make sure that the financial incentives are right? Um, and how do we ensure that folks that can't afford their bills today are not um, pushed further into poverty by uh, increased bills, right? And, and that's a tricky one. Um, and, you know, we both want the markets and the state and federal incentives to work to spur this activity and move it on uh, as quickly as possible. But we also cannot be burdening uh, folks that are already living at the margins. And I don't hear as much discussion on that second point as I would like. Um, you know, the city's been very, very aggressively pursuing um, bill, you know, bill discounts through rate cases and other means. Um, but, you know, I, I think we have to we have to tackle this issue of who's paying for what um, and how do we bring people out of uh, being energy cost burdened. So I, I think that's the piece for me that that's missing. Man. Oh, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Yep, I was on mute. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Noah, um, 
What's your biggest worry, frustration, um, barrier that you see about solar development in New York City? I mean, you mentioned a few with the community credit and the the new customer benefit charge, I think it's called, but are those the top yeah, we're, other things we're, you'd like to mention? Yeah, generally speaking in the solar industry, we're referring to that as the solar tax. But yes, I think that those those are like two near-term challenges. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll echo Suzanne's Point. I think it's a really good one about energy burden. Um, but the point that I would make is that I think that distributed solar can really help address both, both sides of the equation on energy burden. Um, we can lift folks out of poverty by, by creating good jobs and uh, actually connecting folks to those jobs so their income increases. That's the best way to address energy burden. Um, and then with community shared solar and, and other products like that, that make solar savings available to everyone. Um, you know, I think that between those two things, I think there's a way to get it done. Um, and I would encourage, I, I think that there's an opportunity for us to have not, not a scarcity mindset, but, a, but an abundance mindset and say, the way that we're gonna make our transition to clean energy just and equitable isn't taxing clean energy so that it's, it's fair. Um, it's, it's making sure that everyone can access and benefit from clean energy and making sure that we really are building solar and clean energy in disadvantaged communities. We really are, deploying resources in a way that are maximizing community benefit. Thanks so much for that. We do have a, a question um, submitted by an audience member and it's for Luke and Shashank. What's the biggest challenge to bringing the clean path transmission line over the finish line? Uh, yeah, I think that's a fair question. Um, you know, so we just got off the, the starting block. Um, so in terms of thinking about the finish line, it seems like a long way off. But, uh, you know, I think that from my point of view, realistically, it's um, developing a shared understanding with communities throughout the state about uh, the wisdom and benefits uh, to us all for pursuing uh, a large scale project like this. Um, and, you know, I know we, we talk about it being focused on transmitting energy into zone J, uh, but the reality is there are several layers of benefit at play here from um, the clean power that's going to be generated throughout the state that won't be, gen that won't be uh, sent down the transmission line to New York that will directly benefit those host communities. Um, to host community payments associated with generation build out, uh, to economic development impacts, air quality benefits, um, and all the rest of it. Uh, but driving that message to communities as diverse as those in upstate New York, those in the Western Catskills, those in the Hudson Valley, and those in the very dense urban areas of New York City, um, I think is, is just what needs to be done on a project with this level of, of geographic disbursement. Um, and what we need to be able to do is engender the support of all those communities along the way uh, so that we can really get this done. So anybody who wants to uh, help amplify that message, uh, we're live on social media. Uh, we're gonna be going in front of the Public Service Commission for a uh, public comment period in the coming months where communities will have their voice be heard. I would encourage everybody who's supportive of clean energy to get involved in amplifying um, how great of a concept this really is. Thanks for that. I'm just hesitating to see if Shashank, you wanted to add anything, are you good? <laughs> no, I think Luke uh, hit it on the head. Okay. How about you, Nathaniel, when you're, you know, you've been at this a long time and, and I share Suzanne's sense of optimism, even though if you look at everything that needs to happen, it is pretty daunting. Um, in the offshore wind space, what are you worried about? What could you think could be some bumps in the road for, for New York's offshore wind industry? Um, I, I think my feelings both about offshore wind and, and renewables and sort of big picture solutions more generally are, are the same, which is to say, uh, at this point, I think we've passed the tipping point and these technologies are, are winning in the marketplace. Um, 
and that I think really enables that that mindset of abundance that Noah I think rightly uh, pointed us to. The challenge is not whether we are going to tr make this transition at this point; it's whether we're going to make it fast enough. Um, and uh, so, in the offshore wind space, you know, offshore wind is an exciting technology. It's a great uh, um, complement to our onshore renewables. Um, my concern is uh, if the first projects um, stumble, uh, you know, in their conservation and prote marine protection measures or in their labor um, or, uh, you know, in, in a, any number of other ways, that's going to slow down the public support um, that the, the Clean Path guys have very rightly pointed out as sort of critical to keeping all of the gears moving. Um, and, uh, so that, you know, we need all of these projects, these, especially these first of the kind projects, but even the technologies that we've been doing for a long time, we need them to be, uh, um, you know, doing the community outreach, building up the, the sort of broad base of support from labor to environmental justice, uh, to, um, you know, good old local tree huggers, we got to get them all on board and, uh, and keep them on board and make sure they're pushing our elected representatives to, uh, you know, be pushing the you know, policies that will advance this faster. Because it's not just about getting there, it's about getting there before we, you know, we really incur the, the worst, uh, most catastrophic impacts of climate change. And the communities that are already, you know, on the front line know that those costs the most. Um, so getting their support is, is I think, sort of, you know, that's the, 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 the sign that we're doing this right. Thanks, Nathaniel. Um, I have a question. First of all, we're going to go till 2.05. So um, we're going to be slightly late back to the main conference, but I already told them. <laughs> um, there is a question here for, as Nathaniel referred to, and you will henceforth be known as the Clean Path Guys <laughs> together. Um, it's kind of a long question, but it's about the pumped storage um, portion of your project. Um, this questioner is curious to understand the role of the existing pumped storage in the transaction. It's a great idea and concept, and we'd like to understand if it's replicable. Um, as an existing asset that's already providing services to the NISO market, um, it's not a clean slate. How will, I think it means to say, how will you use to smooth renewables production on the line interact with the historical market services? So a little bit more on the role of the Gilboa Blenheim project in your project. Sure. I guess we'll take uh, clean path guys, or maybe we need another band name to uh, go by. Um, you know, the, the question is fair and, and is accurate. You know, the, the pump storage facility already plays a, a role within NISO and, and has a purpose in um, serving as a resource within the market. The What we'll be doing with Clean Path, um, as was noted there, is is more efficiently utilizing that facility. So the, go, the idea is not to take away from anything it's currently doing, but really just to use it to its maximum potential and, and unlock that you know, the, the value of that facility that's not currently being used. So really the uh, goal is to augment what it's doing now, not, uh, not displace anything. Got it. Thank you. Uh, one last question. This one's for Nathaniel um, from another attendee. What are the biggest challenges to responsible development of offshore wind? How do you juxtapose these challenges against the imperative of the climate crisis? Uh, that's, uh, um, I would say the, the biggest challenge, I, th I think I've already sort of touched on lightly, but, you know, the, you know, there's a hierarchy in, uh, that we talk about in, in citing, you know, all sort of human development, but certainly in the energy of avoiding, minimizing, mitigating. So we need to avoid places, uh, that are, you know, particularly rich in, uh, in biodiversity, minimize our impact as we go through the siting and then mitigate the impacts that we do have. Um, and that's really, you know, we're, we are trying to build out the offshore wind industry in real time as we learn how to do it. Um, 
And if we didn't have a climate crisis, uh, you know, uh, maybe we could do these things sort of sequentially, do lots of, uh, you know, uh, uh, monitoring and study and, and figure out exactly how all the marine environments got to respond to everything. But we do, so we have to do these things parallel. And that means really making sure that we invest in the, the science alongside uh, developing the projects. Um, I, I, I want to be clear, you know, I, I obviously my background, my organization, uh, I think the onshore aspects of offshore wind are, you know, every bit as important. So making sure that we really are, uh, you know, engaging the communities around the ports where these projects will, uh, from where these projects will be developed, making sure that there are jobs in those communities for those uh, communities, um, that we're building out the labor force to do all of this right that we're building out the whole supply chain really to do it right and, and building it out just as we're trying to make sure we put the projects in the water the right way, make sure we build out the steel and iron supply, the, the gearbox, the blades, make sure we're doing all of those um, in a way that is also uh, environmentally and responsible and responsible to the climate crisis. Steel is one of the greatest sources of carbon emissions in our economy around the world. We need to make sure we're cleaning up the steel industry at the same time that we're putting onshore uh, offshore wind projects in the water. So uh, it's a you really kind of got to come at it from a, a you know a, a holistic approach. Uh, the Biden administration talks about a whole of government. Um, I think we need to be thinking about a whole of economy, um, but we can get there. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, we are out of time, but uh, there still is enough time for me to say thank you. Uh, I really appreciate all your contributions. You know, it's not easy or maybe possible to say um, exactly when we will clean New York City's grid, but it's absolutely uh, true that we won't get there without in-city solar, without offshore wind, without new transmission, and without a system to make sure that um, New Yorkers are not overly burdened with um, electric bills that they can't pay. So uh, these are all uh, factors that are interacting. I really appreciate you um, lending your expertise to us today. So thank you. And uh, for those of you uh, who are with us here, all 50 of you, now is the time where you go to the chat and you click on the uh, link to join the main conference. Um, we've got another great speaker joining us. Um, so if you just jump back over to the other conference, um, you can do that now. If it asks you, do you wanna leave this Zoom and join another, you say yes. Alternatively, you can disconnect and click on the link that you used this morning or when you first joined the ACE conference. So uh, we'll see you over there. And uh, thank you so much again to our panelists. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, everyone.